So um, apologies for the sensationalism on the um, title. <laughs> I have to try and get everyone's attention and tune in to a remote seminar. So, oh, it's Felix. Welcome back, Felix. So a couple of people still in the waiting room who I am allowing in. <clears throat> Welcome to the other people that um, aren't part of the department. It's great to see some unfamiliar names. So you're very welcome, and hopefully this will be of interest to you as well. Um, as a disclaimer, the content here uh, is quite management focused uh, due to the team that I work with. Um, however, there are marketing implications, which I will uh, allude to earlier on in the presentation. Right, we could probably get started. If I start to lag, I'll turn my own camera off. Um, but can everyone see the screen that I'm sharing, the PowerPoint presentation? You can just do a thumbs up reaction. Very good, cool. Okay, so this is a welcome to the Department of Marketing seminar. Um, the title, as you can say, is Would You Tell Me If You Are Faking? And RRT, uh, so that stands for the Random Response Technique. Um, can I get a thumbs up if anyone's heard of this random response technique before? No, okay, well, great, because uh, until I worked with this, this team, um, I had no idea what it was either. But the methodology behind it is completely fascinating to me. And those of you that are, um, and it's a, it's a quantitative technique, so surprising that I'm presenting it, but uh, the statistics behind it is surprisingly simple. Even I can understand it. But for those of you in the audience who are quant, quant minded, uh, such as you know Catherine uh, and Felix, um, be interesting to to get your feedback on this uh, afterwards. So it's a well established technique. It was first introduced as a means of soliciting honest answers to some sensitive subject matter. So questions like uh, when was the last time you used a prostitute? Um, you know, do you do, do you ever lie on job interviews, which is the, the topic that we're um, using this technique on. So the RRT, or the random response technique, is just one part of the contributions of today's uh, presentation, today's seminar. Um, part of it is the results of this, the, the actual uh, study, but I think for most of you, the methodology behind it is, is probably what's uh, of even more interest. Um, so just before I, care, uh, I continue, when I said a team, I really meant a team. So this is personally the biggest team I've ever worked with, led by Cornelius Koenig, which uh, fittingly enough in German means king. Uh, he's a really nice guy uh, from the University of Saarland in Germany. And this is his team there. Um, and that's just the team uh, at Saarland. Uh, then the rest of the team from the South Pacific all the way uh, through the uh, Americas, uh, Japan, even South America. Uh, and then here I am in Auckland, also our compatriots in the Waikato, uh, University of Waikato, uh, some Canadians, uh, the old Romanian, Russian. Uh, so overall, 20 countries, um, a massive number of academics and part of the team, and that enabled us to get 3,800 responses uh, from these countries here. And so part of the contribution today is to give you some descriptive statistics on, uh, which of these countries, uh, fake the most or provide, uh, well, let's just say they lie when they are being interviewed for a job. So that's, that's of interest. This uh, study has been subsequently published in the, uh, journal of applied psychology and the international review. Uh, and this is the title here for those of you that want a little bit more detail. Uh, economic predictors of differences in interview faking between countries. Uh, and then we looked at economic inequality versus uh, the state of the economy. So as I mentioned before, this, is, this has a huge management sort of spin to it uh, because it is about when people fake uh, during an interview process within a recruitment drive. Um, but from, to bring it back to the marketing uh, you know, the field, um, even though it seems very management, we talk about external versus internal stakeholders in marketing. So Rod, who's um, happy to see him here, uh, will we'll have provided that uh, famous triangle of your external, your internal, uh, you know, promises that you make. Uh, so usually marketing, we talk about making those external promises, communicating external promises to our, to our stakeholders, in that case, the customers. But part of delivering on those promises is control or management of the internal stakeholders, or in this case, our employees. 
And so that's the importance of internal branding. And deciding who to hire is obviously of huge importance to your brand and the organization. So this is how it ties in to marketing, um, uh, albeit perhaps a bit spori sporadic. But there is definitely the influence of hiring on your subsequent uh, delivering of your marketing promises. Um, but what if the people you're hiring are not who they say they are, right? So what if they are um, partaking in false advertising when you are trying to hire these people? And so that's the, the topic of today's seminar. So what is faking? Uh, so in this particular context, uh, it is when the applicant intentionally distorts or falsifies their responses to create a specific impression. And often it's a more positive impression, right? So that they get the job. Um, so this doesn't you know, just happen in interviews, although this is what we're interested in, but also in personality tests. People in psychology might refer to this as impression management, and other uh, theorists call this social desirability, right? So they're all fairly similar concepts, uh, and it's essentially faking, because it's misrepresentation of what you're really thinking and what you've really done in the past. And it's an important topic because, you know, as I mentioned before, if you're trying to deliver on external promises, your, your internal, your housekeeping has to be there. So you have to, be make, you have to make sure you're hiring the right people, not just people who say they're something, but actually act in a different way. So, and it's also important because applicants who fake or lie or misrepresent themselves gain an unfair advantage over honest applicants who might be better for the job, right? And subsequently a better representative of your, of your marketing efforts. Um, so three contributions, I want to keep it simple um, for the seminar. Three things I want you to focus on or take home uh, from this is one, who is faking, so that's probably what attracted you uh, to the seminar in the first place. Uh, but more specifically, we're talking about where the fakers. So not so much who is faking as an individual, but which countries. So where are these fakers located? Which countries are fake? And this was pretty easily um, shared or communicated by some descriptive data that I'll take you through. Um, more interesting for me and the rest of the team was why are they faking? So we look at some correlational data there. Uh, and then finally, for the, the methodologists uh, in the audience, how? So how did we know they were faking? Because if you're asking if someone's lying, if they're liars, why would they tell you they were lying, right? And so this is what really got me interested in this project in the first place, this random response technique. So that's the method that we'll talk about. How did we get them to admit that they were faking? So uh, let's start with the who. Uh, we know that faking by potential employees is ubiquitous, so it's everywhere. Uh, our data su certainly suggests that it does happen uh, all over the place, but that it varies between different countries. And so you're probably interested uh, in you know, which countries have the biggest liars, right? Um, so some applicants from certain countries are definitely more prone to faking compared to others, right? But the reasons for these are largely unexplored. So this kind of brings us to the why, the second contribution. So we had two... Uh, competing hypotheses. Uh, the first reason was based around GDP or gross domestic product. Or product. Um, and the reason there is that if you're in a country with a healthy economy and therefore because the health the economy is healthy there are more job vacancies uh, therefore that's a lower employment rate and in those applicants you know people should have fewer reasons to fake um, than when cut you know, people are struggling to find a job in a country whose economy is not so healthy, where their GDP is low, right? So the hypothesis there is then, it's based around the state of the national economy. So the lower the GDP per capita, uh, and the higher the unemployment rate, the more people in those countries are likely to fail. So that's one hypothesis. Um, the second reason is about inequality. Hence the diagram here. So the reasoning there is that economic inequality might trigger people's perceptions that the world is competitive. And other research has shown that competitiveness uh, has, been, has been related to faking, right? Um, similarly, compounding this sort of idea that the world's a bit of a cutthroat place and therefore you have to you know, lie or build yourself up to get ahead, compounding that is that in an unequal country where we're all, in a country where wealth is unequally uh, distributed, then the poor people or the less affluent people have more to gain if they are successful. And therefore the incentive to fake might be higher, right? 
likewise, compounding this once again, is that the affluent people, so the rich people in these countries where wealth is not evenly distributed, will have more to lose if they are not successful. So once again, there is this similar incentive to build yourself up because if you don't get that great job and become successful, then you're, you've got a lot to lose uh, given the background that you've come from, right? Whether that be lose economically or socially or psychologically, you know, there's that incentive there. So hypothesis two then is based around economic inequality. So the higher the economic equality of the country, the more people in that country will engage in interviewing banking, right? So that's hypothesis two. So some of the measures we use in order to try and figure these things out uh, was obviously GDP, because that was one of the things we were hypothesizing about. So the team got data from the World uh, Bank, uh, open data webpage, and sub, uh, supplemented or complemented that with uh, information from the CEIC. Um, and then we and you wrote, we were able to get uh, information on inequality through those two sources as well. But then to build onto that, we also use the National Gini Index, uh, and these are all established measures of both GDP um, as well as uh, economic inequality. Uh, and then uh, so that was sort of I guess you know secondary data. Uh, but then in terms of the primary data we needed to collect, it was uh, items on faking. So there were 14 established items about uh, faking behavior during a person's uh, most recent interview. Uh, and these are established items. For the purposes of this study, they were reduced down to 11 items. Um, so and I'll, I will take you through each of those items later uh, and show you descriptively which countries score the highest uh, on those particular faking items. So this is the, the procedure. So the, the entire team, those. Um, Many academics that we, covered, we, we acknowledged at the beginning of the presentation all received a link. Uh, well, we are shown the link of the following procedure. We fed back on it, uh, and then it was you know, iterated, improved, and then we sent this link out to our own sort of um, panels or samples within our own countries. Uh, so the procedure uh, in all cases started with five qualifying questions. So some examples of those were, you know, when did your last job take place? job interview, sorry, take place. How strongly did you wish to get the job? So questions that basically established that they were able to participate in the, uh, in the survey, having uh, interviewed at least uh, one job recently. Uh, then we explained to them RRT, or the random response technique, and how this would work. So I'll, I'll uh, break that up a little bit more later, how we explained it to them. Um, and then uh, they were exposed to the 14 uh, true or false items on their faking behavior in their last interview. So once again, these are established items. So some examples of this is, I overemphasize or exaggerate my positive attributes during the application process, for instance, hardworking, detail-oriented efficiency. And then they had to answer true or false, right? So if you answer true to this, that means you're faking. If you answer false, that means you don't fake. Uh, similarly, another question was, when applying for a job, I tend to de-emphasize or play down what, might cons what some might consider negative attributes. Once again, if you say yes to this, then you're a faker because you're, you're downplaying what you're not very good at. Uh, and if you say no to this, false, then you are not a faker. In other words, you are honest. Um, so in terms of the RRT, um, the way we explain it, so we don't go into this much detail. This is simply for the, uh, to explain the methodology, how it works, the really interesting thing in my opinion. Um, but for the respondents, we told them that uh, we're using this random response technique to guarantee anonymity and to solicit uh, right answers. Um, if you follow this technique, there is no way for the experimenters to know whether you're really lying or not. And so the, the concept there is that if the researchers don't know whether you're providing a real answer or a fake answer, then you will not feel judged that you are a liar, okay? And you're like, well, hang on, how does that even work with the data collection? So this is how it works. We get them to throw a dice. So in some countries we say, do the survey with a dice. If you throw the dice and it lands on a one or a two, then you will give us what's called a forced response. And we want you to answer yes to these true and false questions. So yes, I fake. Whether you do fake or you don't fake, we don't actually care. If you throw a one, or two, we want you to say yes, right? 
Uh, and in other countries, such as the New Zealand sample that I helped provide, we used an online dice, uh, you know, a random generation uh, program uh, on the internet, uh, which essentially is like a dice. So they click on the dice and it randomly gives them a number between one and six. And we say, once again, if you get one and two, just say yes. And so that means that when they throw a three, four, five, or six, the other four numbers, there's a two third possibility that they will answer truthfully, right? Um, and so the, the beauty of this technique is that because they, we don't know when they are lying, they can feel um, completely protected in answering as truthfully as possible on a sensitive subject matter. Whether that subject matter is, have you ever used a prostitute? Or did you lie in your last um, job interview? Do you participate in you know, unsafe sex? Any sensitive topic matter, people should feel comfortable to answer honestly because we don't know as the uh, experimenters or the researchers whether they're actually answering true or false. But, so, you know, essentially that means you would think the data is useless, right? Because a third of the time they're lying. But according to this technique, this is how the statistics works. And it's, it's elegantly uh, simple. Because we know that one third of the answers will be a forced response, that means that we can disregard one third of the answers that are true. All right, so in this case, if we had a sample of 12 people, probability, uh, in terms of probability, we know that a third of them will be forced to make a yes answer, right? Whereas two thirds of them will be allowed to make an honest answer. And so we automatically get rid of half of the yes answers because we know that half of uh, this, you know, the two thirds is one third. So we get rid of one third. And that means the remaining answers we get are more accurate. They're more truthful because the subject matter is so sensitive that people would not normally provide a true answer for fear of being, you know, uh, judged, right, uh, in some way. And so, so the way this technique works is that you're sacrificing um, accuracy for honesty in some ways. Um, and it only works, obviously, then at this massive, uh, at a group level, right, because we, we don't know what individual throws uh, what dice, um, it only works when your sample size is big enough to take into account the random chance that two thirds of those positive responses, the socially undesirable responses will be discarded and forced response, right? And so then the answer here of the honest responses can vary uh, and for illustration purposes, it's simply 50-50. And so based on this sample here, which is just illustrative, 50% of these people fake. Right, so that's how the methodology works. And we'll have time later on to talk a little bit more about this, uh, this RRT technique. Right, so what happened with the sample? Uh, mean age was 23, uh, slightly larger female participation, 20% experience at least uh, one or two jobs in their life, 61 had three or more interviews, um, uh, just over a third undergrads, a third uh, postgrads, and 10% higher master's degree. Uh, higher, a master's degree or higher. So here are the actual descriptive results. So to answer the very first contribution, who uh, fakes the most? So I'll just spend a bit of time because this is also one way to get familiar with the items we use. So the first item I overemphasize uh, my positive attributes. So I've highlighted New Zealand here. Uh, and that's, this is Fiji. So Fiji scored the highest on that one. Uh, second item, I outright fabricated, so I lied, made up information about myself and applied for a job. Uh, so the country is Spain that won that one. Uh, when applying for a job, I exaggerated my work experience to make myself look more impressive. US got that one, but guys, <laughs> not that surprising. Um, when applying for a job, I claimed to have experience I didn't have. Spain. When applying for a job, I claimed to have knowledge I did not have, uh, United uh, Arab Emirates. When applying for a job, I exaggerated my past work uh, performance evaluation that myself look better, uh, that's China. Uh, when applying for a job, I exaggerated my skills, the US. When applying for a job, I exaggerated qualities uh, of myself, such as dependability and reliability, G. And when applying for a job, I gave false opinions, the US. Uh, last two items, as I mentioned, there are 14 original items for this, for this um, study, we only use these 11. When applying for the job, I try to portray myself as more agreeable than I really am, China. 
that's not surprising either, given the sort of the, what we know of some Asian cultures in terms of being agreeable. Uh, when applying for the job, I tended to de-emphasize or play down what some might consider negative attributes. Now, uh, you'll notice New Zealand is a little bit, it's, we're not the highest, but we're pretty high on this one. Uh, but you'll be, I guess it's reassuring to know that New Zealand did not get the highest score in any of those faking items. Uh, but it was interesting that we got pretty high on this one. And the whole playing down um, or de-emphasizing the negative attributes is such a Kiwi thing to do, right? We're never going to boast ourselves up, but we might play down what we're not so good at, right? Uh, because of the whole toll point. So I found these descriptive stats, as simple as they are, quite interesting. So moving on to why. So this was testing hypothesis one and two. So looking at correlational data. Um, so you'll see here that the only significant uh, results we got was the relationship between income inequality uh, and, and faking, right? Um, so in terms of the discussion, the general economic indicators as measured by GDP and the unemployment rate uh, was not significantly correlated with faking. However, economic inequality was positively related uh, to the extent of African faking, um, to a substantial, significant extent. Um, so the overall conclusion is that it's not the overall wealth of a country uh, that's driving faking behavior, but how that wealth is distributed, right? And so I guess, you know, uh, this presentation is also timely as we head into the next election, uh, New Zealand election, because um, obviously there is conflicting viewpoints of, of whether uh, the, it's the GDP and getting economic productivity up that is going to help move the country forward, or if, is it the way that the wealth is distributed that is going to move the country forward? Now this seminar, the, the study doesn't explain, uh, answer any of those questions, but it does show that if you don't want people to fake, then it's the wealth distribution that you should be more concerned about than the health of the economy. Right. So in summary, in terms of who, uh, we showed that some people are more sensitive uh, to inequality than to general economic indicators when it comes to faking. And those countries were shown in the descriptive data uh, a couple of slides ago. Uh, but more importantly, the why. And so the why, the psychology behind it is that inequality might lead to certain processes like envy. And we could go all the way back to social comparison theory, right, uh, in which, you know, uh, People compare themselves to what's happening within their social surroundings rather than across countries, right? So two poor people in Ethiopia um, are going to be more concerned about how the other Ethiopians are doing uh, than the fact that Ethiopia's GDP is lower than American GDP, right? Likewise, two Americans are going to be more concerned about how wealth is distributed within America than the fact that America has a higher GDP than Ethiopia. Right? And so that's the reasoning behind why uh, inequality might lead to certain psychological processes, uh, one of which might be envy, um, that may then lead to unethical behavior such as faking. And finally, the how. So methodologically speaking, RRT, or random response technique, uh, is one potential tool for encouraging honest responses uh, to sensitive topics. Uh, but within that, there is this trade-off uh, between survey accuracy versus survey honesty. And for the purposes of this study, we thought that it was better to get uh, fewer honest usable items than 100% of items that were uh, answered, but you didn't know what people were answering truthfully or not. Right, so uh, it's, it's a relatively quick one because it's not too complicated. Uh, so thank you very much. This is the, um, the link for the paper, uh, which is probably of not much use to you here in this format. But um, I'm happy to take any questions now, um, and also really happy to hear what your thoughts are on RRT, because as I said, before I uh, joined the study, I, I had not heard about it, but it was fascinating uh, me, the way the psychology behind that methodology and how it worked. So thank you very much, everyone. So if you have any questions, um, you can open it up. Just uh, either send me a, uh, a chat or now I'm going to stop sharing screen. Um, and then I can see what's happening to chats. So I don't see any chats.
Mike, one question, if I can just talk probably. Um, we, you say, you know, I get the process that you've traded off some accuracy um, for getting, you know, honest responses, if you will. Do you think that the blurring of that data may then, you know, increase the variability that you're seeing in that data and that might explain why some of those relationships aren't significant? Those correlations? I'll unmute myself there. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Catherine. I think the it may or may not be. I think the whole um, methodology really relies on probability. And so if, if you have a big enough sample and you can guarantee essentially that two thirds, or what, sorry, one third of your response, or one third of your positive responses to those items are forced responses and you disregard them, then you're working with two thirds of your sample left. But of the two thirds of your sample left, uh, the answers provided to those items are 100% uh, um, honest. Um, so in terms of how that then affects the variability um, or the variance, sorry, within the, the data, I personally uh, couldn't answer. Um, in my mind, I'm thinking it, doesn't make much of a difference because two one third, which were the positive responses, are disregarded. So you're dealing with, um, you know, a sample of accurate responses. But I don't know. I mean, you could explain uh, to me how how what, what what's the thinking that's happening in your head. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think um, I'm just giving top of mind thoughts. You know, it's just interesting as to why that might be. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, anyone else that's a stats guru, I'm certainly not a stats guru, but uh, it fascinated me because the probability makes sense in my mind if you have a big enough sample and if you don't try and deal with individual level data. So I don't know, maybe Leo or Felix or some other other uh, guests here that are very quant-minded could share their thoughts on what, what, what you guys think about this technique. I mean, I found it, personally, I found it fascinating. I've never heard of it. It's really interesting, Mike. I think it makes sense. Uh, I, I agree with the explanation. Um, I, I did have a few thoughts on a completely different line about the cross-country differences. Um, two points that you may have considered. Uh, one is looking at differences in the Hofstede dimensions. Does that explain any of the differences in the countries? And the other one, when comparing the countries, have you thought about response styles that, that may differ and also explain uh, differences across countries. By response style, do you mean whether it was an online dice or an offline dice? No, just the way people respond in different countries. Some go um, towards midpoints, others will, in some countries, people will um, respond more extremely, um, extremely positive or extremely negative. And that sometimes does um, influences the mean values on variables within a country. Yeah, no, that's, that's a very a valid point there, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if we did or uh, didn't, but uh, with regards to the Hofstetters, uh, yeah, certainly I think that does probably explain, I, I, I sort of briefly alluded to a couple of, um, you know, descriptive statistics that caught my eye looking at the data. And I did, um, you know, a lot of it does seem to fall within the, what you would expect uh, based on the Hofstetter's values, um, that you know the Americans were scoring slightly higher on those um, the the items that were about building yourself up. Um, in New Zealand, even though we were never the highest on any of the items, thankfully, uh, the one that we did score highest on within our own country was the one where we felt it was okay to downplay our negative attributes, but we never thought it was okay to just outright lie about uh, positive attributes that did not exist. Um, so that was interesting. And then there was the other uh, question about agreeableness. Um, so I guess if we look at Hofstede, that would be the power distance within an Asian country. Uh, perhaps that uh, when you're interviewing, you're trying to you know, respect your, your elders or your, or your senior. And that's why it's more important to pretend to be more agreeable than you might actually be. Um, so but, uh, so that's, uh, that's as much as I can say in terms of um, my limited knowledge of uh, Hofstetters and, and uh, the data that we currently did collect. I don't think um, we didn't collect any specific Hofstetter related dimension. 
It'd be quite easy to collect those. I mean, they're generally known about countries, so you could even yeah. do a follow-up on it. I, I, I think, yeah, I think the point of power distance is an interesting one that could that you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. No problems. I mean, I'll bring up. Um, tell you what, I'll bring up the. Um, so yeah, so these are some of the items. So we went through pretty quickly, but I highlighted the, the top score, I guess, would be what we could gain. And so we noticed here with the American uh, sample, the questions about, uh, you know, making yourself look better. Um, and also, well, this one here, you could argue, face false opinions that could be about agreeability as well. Um, whereas this one here, was New Zealand was here. That was the highest thing we scored on. <clears throat> yeah, so you could probably see some Hofstetter's dimensions playing out in, in the screen here. Any other questions? So with the RRT, I think, uh, as I mentioned, it was you know originally conceived when dealing with sensitive topics. Uh, I think the very first study in 86, um, might have been to do with use of uh, prostitutes, um, but then subsequently they've been used in health research on you know, more sort of sensitive topics. Uh, there was some discussion during the write-up about use of online dice versus manual dice, and so some of the researchers were sort of in favor of providing a link to an online dice, which participants could click on while they did the survey, whereas other uh, researchers insisted on using participants using their own manual dice, which is, you know, a bit of a barrier for participation because, I mean, how many of us would just go find a dice if we don't play board games regularly? And given the majority of these students were uni students, we weren't sure how many of them would actually, you know, have a board game in their flat. Uh, and so we opted for to, to provide an online dice as well. We, we, sort of gave them an option. Either you do it with the dice or use the online dice. Um, but then there was some possible uh, discussion about how if you were recommended an online dice program, whether or not you thought the results of those roles were somehow traceable because you've got an electronic footprint all of a sudden. And so we did wonder whether the use of the online dice uh, might have, um, I guess, um, you know, diluted the effect of the RRT treatment because if because it only really works if the researchers don't know what number your dice roll. If you think that the researchers can somehow retrospectively go back through your cookies and, and figure out which dice you did roll and then figure out whether you're a uh, faker or not, uh, then that might um, mitigate some of the benefits of RRT. Uh, so that was just one of the things we kind of discussed as a team. Um, uh, for proceeding, but we decided to provide an online uh, option just for participation. I'll be interested to hear from some of the um, other other audience members here if, uh, if you think this would work, uh, given your research areas, or if you just prefer the good old simple, uh, you know, the old-fashioned uh, disclaimer at the front that says there are no right or wrong answers. Your answers will remain confidential, your participation is anonymous. Uh, those standard sort of um, privacy and confidentiality disclaimers that we provide on our participants' information sheets, uh, which most survey research uses anyway. Uh, whereas the RRT is kind of an additional step on top of that to really try and guarantee anonymity. No? Right, any other questions? We can. Finish. It's quite interesting yeah. the group that you did it with, you know, a fairly low mean age group, 23 or something like that. Because we did a study um, a while ago, or a colleague of mine did a study for um, a manufacturer of condoms looking at sexual activity. And, um, and they actually did that through, it was. Um, a piece of a qual piece of research, but they did it through online qual rather than face to face because of obviously a lot of the discussion that was being had wouldn't have been sociable in a focus group. 
and um, or similar setting, but they did want to allow them to sort of talk about things um, clearly. And one of the things that he said was he was surprised by how explicit and honest everyone was in that discussion. Um, so I wonder if um, this has been looked at in terms of um, its effectiveness, you know, be it more or less effective in terms of age groups, because it appears that some age groups may be more trusting of online confidentiality than others, or less caring, perhaps, might be the word. Yeah, that's a good point, Catherine. And I think it really depends on the topic matter as well. Like, um, you know, if it's about, um, you know, uh, sex practice and all that, then maybe a young group um, is totally okay with it. But in this case, it's about job banking, so maybe uh, they feel a little bit more sort of uh, dicey about admitting to this in case somehow mm -hmm. they think it gets back to their employers or something like that. Um, so yeah, I think it's uh, definitely topic related um, and most probably most definitely um, age related as well. Um, and that kind of ties back to what I said about the online dice, how some people might have thought it was not 100% random because it could, or no, sorry, it was, whether it was random or not, that it could be traced what, what dice they rolled and therefore uh, they could figure out whether they were lying or not. Um, um, so yeah, I don't know what an older audience group would have responded to uh, in terms of this, this sort of type of uh, technique. Um, but definitely, I guess, yeah, related to the topic matter as well, I would say. Mm, it's really interesting. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Kat. All right, thanks, everyone. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to contact me. Otherwise, if you want to read more about the topic, it's this one here. Um, and apart from that, I think I can finish now. Yeah, so thank you very much.